Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started here in just a few moments. Um, we look forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Susan Abeline today. Really grateful for, for taking the time to be here today. If you have any questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A. Also, feel free to uh, let us know where you're listening in from in the chat box. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in a moment.
Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this NCEA webinar presented in partnership with Vax Education Solutions. Uh, today we have Dr. Susan Aveline with us. She's an academic coaching manager for Vax Education Solutions um, presenting with us uh, today on choosing the best coaching model. So we're very grateful to have her on today. Uh, thanks so much, Susan. And uh, before we get going, let's begin as we do all things in prayer. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to learn. Please bless our presenter and bless our audience today and those who will be um, engaging with us um, in our on-demand webinar as well. We pray uh, in Jesus' name, amen. In the name amen. of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items for you today. Um, this webinar is being recorded. You'll receive a link to the on-demand webinar uh, in a follow-up email. Uh, you'll also be able to receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar. So you can do that by completing a brief survey evaluation. Afterwards, you'll be directed to that survey after the webinar ends, and you'll also uh, receive a link to that in the chat box and in your follow-up email as well. Um, so feel free to engage with us, uh, as well as your colleagues, in the chat box and the Q&A. Uh, if there's a specific question you'd like us to address, uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A uh, rather than the chat box so we make sure uh, to catch it. Um, so once again, thank, thank you to everyone for joining us, uh, and a warm thank you to FACS um, for collaborating with us in this project. So now it's my pleasure to pass it off to Dr. Aveline. So thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Thank you, John, and thank you, uh, those that are on this uh, webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, this webinar is looking at this meta-analysis that was completed by researchers Matthew Kraft and Dylan Hogan from Brown University, and um, David Blazer from Harvard University. Um, I'm happy to take your questions, um, but I prefer to do it at the end of the presentation. Uh, I will periodically check the Q&A box just in case, but um, easier for me personally to take them at the end of the, uh, end of the presentation. Um, and you're welcome to contact me after the webinar uh, if you have any questions or comments. Um, for me, I've served as a teacher, a principal, an assistant superintendent in both the Archdiocese of New York and Los Angeles, and have been responsible for teacher and principal formation um, as both an attendee and a deliverer of numerous conferences and workshops. I have hoped to gain some learning, some nugget um, that would be a valuable takeaway for my staff, um, for myself, um, and such that it would impact, you know, teaching and learning. So that's my hope for you today as well. So my view of coaching <laughs> was very limited to sports. Um, I was a competitive athlete in um, both college and high school and college. And as seen here, these pics from the 1980s, uh, where I always seem to be dead center uh, <laughs> in these celebratory photos with, uh, with my teammates and coaches, um, uh, or here standing with my soccer coach and none too happy with the fact that I had to sit out of this game due to an injury. Um, and when I became a teacher and even as a principal, I was also a coach of several sports. Um, and so I had a really extremely narrow view of what coaching was as applied to education. Um, after developing numerous workshops on general teaching and learning practices and specific content area PD, I realized the value of follow-up support in the form of coaching. And it was in becoming a coach myself, uh, partnering with superintendents, principals, and teachers that I was able to truly appreciate the impact of working one-on-one -on -one with a fellow educator. So it's a privilege for me to join FACTS Education Solutions and lead the research and design of their coaching program, um, which is in its first phase and will focus on teacher coaching. This is absolutely the right audience to begin with as our teachers are the front lines of achieving our mission uh, in Catholic education. They're both the models and the witnesses to the faith and they are the designers and deliverers of academic excellence. Um, no one is closer to the promise of each school's mission to serve students than the classroom teacher. 
So this is Dr. Atul Gawande. Um, he's a surgeon, a writer, a professor at Harvard Medical School. He's also a public health leader who's been a staff writer for The New Yorker, um, and he's written four books that are on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, he's a strong advocate for coaching, uh, not only in medicine, but in business and education um, and other fields as well. Um, and if you like, uh, if you'd like to be further inspired by Dr. Gwande, I would encourage you to watch this 16 minute TED talk that's uh, referenced um, via the link uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, one of his many quotes um, is seen here. And he said, coaching done well, I apologize, coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. Coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. So our, our kind of big idea here, our big question is, 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 is he right? So we're gonna dig into the research. So again, while as a coach for my own professional preparation, I've read and reflected on my own experience um, and I've spoken with other coaches and educators to help me get better. Um, in this role as the academic coaching manager and responsible for designing our facts ed coaching program, um, I had to go deeper into the research. And um, I apologize, my screen is jumping. I had to go deeper into the research um, and, and the writings of well-known authors and practitioners of coaching. Um, thankfully, these three researchers, Kraft, Blazer, and Hogan, published this report, The Effect of Teacher Coaching on Instruction and Achievement, a meta-analysis of the causal evidence. So I just wanna take a moment and break, break this down. Like, what is this report really about? So um, we're gonna unpack this. So the first you know, phrase here is teacher coaching. So what does that mean? Um, teacher coaching is a manner of professional development. And as the researchers began digging into the studies, they found several key features among coaching programs and at the same time found that there's no one set of features that defines every coaching program. Um, given the definitions, um, the multiple definitions that are out there of coaching, the researchers chose to go with um, the, the coaching definition um, asserted by Joyce and Showers. They are really the pioneers of instructional coaching. Um, and they wrote, <laughs> they wrote, um, coaching is characterized by an observation and feedback cycle in an ongoing instructional or clinical situation. So teacher coaching, it's that, that ongoing observation and feedback cycle. And then it focuses on kind of two primary elements, right? Instructional achievement and um, instruction rather and achievement. So instruction is the interaction among teachers, students and content uh, with observation instruments. And, um, and that might include rubrics. Um, and as well as achievement, uh, the results on low stakes and high stakes um, achievement, standardized achievement tests. Um, this is a meta-analysis, which means they looked at a number of independent studies um, of the same subject. So they looked at multiple studies on the subject of coaching, and they were looking for causal evidence, that is the relationship between an activity and its outcomes. So that kind of cause and effect, that uh, relationship between um, an activity and its intended outcomes. This is a study of 60 studies, and it helps us answer the question, does teacher coaching have a positive effect on the relationship between instruction and achievement? Does coaching have that positive effect? The bottom line is, does coaching matter? So how do the authors define coaching programs? So Joyce and Showers discussed and share their definition of coaching itself. Um, how do these authors define coaching programs? So the authors define coaching programs broadly, as I quote, all in-service PD programs where coaches or peers observe teachers' instruction and provide feedback to help them improve. The coaching program is intended to be individualized, time intensive, sustained over the course of a semester or year, context specific and focused on discrete skills. So I'm actually going to spend um, just a few slides sharing the parameters of those 60, stu 60 studies. 
So if you would just please bear with me for the next few slides. Um, again, the authors published their meta-analysis in 2016. They updated it in 2017 and then updated it again in 2018 as they continue to add studies each year, um, such that their report in 2017 had 44 studies and their report in 2018 had 60 studies. Um, they include, again, coaching studies that use causal research designs. Um, and these are from three uh, different sources. Um, one source is the institute reports like, like the US Department of Education um, or the American Institutes for Research. Um, they also include um, a majority uh, peer reviewed journals. So think of um, uh, the Early Childhood Education Journal, the American Educational Research Journal. Um, those were the primary uh, source of studies that they looked at. They also looked at working papers from uh, various researchers who were in the process uh, of um, developing their findings. Um, these 60 publications are from 2006 to 2017, um, and 55 of the 60 are from the United States, while five are from um, Chile and Canada. And here you see on the screen, there are three research questions that drove their meta-analysis. Um, what is the causal effect of teacher coaching programs on classroom instruction and student achievement? Are specific coaching program design elements associated with large effects? And what's the relationship between um, coaching program effects on classroom instruction and achievement? So some characteristics of these studies. I'm going to start with, um, you know, three actual uh, three characteristics. The following um, uh, are some of the characteristics that they studied of the studies that they examined. As you can see, they reviewed coaching pro programs that were general, including pedagogical practices such as improving students classroom behavior. Um, and then they also looked at content specific studies. Um, and instructional strategies for math, reading, science. Um, and you can see the types of um, coaching services that were actually excluded from their, their study. Um, you'll notice too that there's a relationship when you look at school levels and teacher, teacher sample size, um, that there's a relationship between the coaching model type um, and the school levels. Uh, there were several studies that they looked at that focused on coaching support of preschool and elementary reading programs. Um, and then the study did look at teacher sample size uh, and found that larger coaching programs have a lesser impact on instruction and achievement. And I'll share an example of one of those um, shortly. Um, their meta-analysis did not dig into teacher or coach characteristics because the studies themselves did not use common statistics for um, for teacher um, characteristics such as um, you know new teachers novice teachers experienced teachers um, veteran teachers um, nor did they um, look at coaching characteristics like years of experience or training of coaches so they're unable to um, disaggregate the data um, based on teachers or coaches So again, in terms of um, the research, the researchers further define the coaching programs broadly, and, and I'll quote them, uh, uh, as all in-service PD programs that incorporate key, uh, coaching as a key feature of the model. Um, they characterize the coaching process as one where instructional experts um, work with teachers to discuss classroom practice in a way that is individualized, intensive, uh, context specific and focused. So, so coaching programs um, that are individualized. So they're one on one, um, one teacher to one coach. Um, I will say that this meta analysis did not look um, or um, study coaching programs where a coach worked with a team of teachers, like a grade level band or a department. Um, coaching programs that are intensive. So they looked. Um, to where the coach and the teacher interacted at least every couple of weeks. Uh, they looked for sustained programs. That is, these are coaching programs that were sustained over a period of time, an extended period of time, um, that were context specific. So teachers who are coached on their practices within the context of their own classroom. 
and then they're focused, um, attentive to the deliberate um, practice of specific skills. So, so these are kind of the five lenses, the five tests that they used uh, to determine whether or not they were going to include a study in their meta-analysis. So given their definition and the characteristics that they, they had um, as the necessary foundation to complete their analysis, I want to go back to, to uh, Dr. Gawande's quote where he said, coaching is the most effective intervention designed for human performance. So is coaching the most effective intervention for professional learning and education as well? Is he right? So let's dig into some of these findings. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, yes. <laughs> the short answer is um, uh, yes, coaching is effective. Um, uh, as you can see, you know, in these two quotes here, um, they found that in 43 studies that measured instructional practice as an outcome, large positive effects of coaching um, on teachers' instructional practices. So we do see an impact um, of coaching on teaching. Um, however, they note that that effectiveness varies across different models uh, of coaching. And then again, across um, coaching models in 31 studies, they found that um, uh, that measure uh, student academic performance on standardized achievement tests found on average teacher coaching also has a positive effect on student achievement. And again, they state that the effects differ across um, across different programs. So I wanted to share these two um, findings in relation to this graphic that was developed by Diane Sweeney and Leanna Harris. They're authors of numerous books on, um, on teacher coaching, or on, I'm sorry, on student-centered coaching. So just notice these three concentric circles. Um, you'll notice relationship driven at the outer um, band, um, followed by teacher-centered coaching, followed by student student-centered coaching with the students at the center. Um, this model conveys the findings in this, um, in this research. Um, in the meta-analysis, teacher coaching had a greater impact on instructional practices than it did on student outcomes. Um, the standard deviations associated with both instructional practice and student achievement are such that um, the impact of coaching was greater on teachers' instructional practice, um, lesser on student achievement. And why is that? It's really about the degree um, of coaching um, and how far it is or how near it is to actually actual um, student learning. So I think that's kind of a powerful thing for us to keep in mind as educators um, when we are considering coaching programs um, is to ensure that whatever coaching program we select, um, that there is a direct connection um, between um, the coaching program and student learning. So now I'll, I'll touch on uh, a little bit more of the research here. Um, they also looked at in-person versus virtual coaching. So in terms of that mode of delivery, um, and what they found is that there's really no significant difference in the impact of coaching on teaching and learning. Uh, so regardless of whether it's in-person or virtual, that delivery mode uh, model uh, really doesn't doesn't matter. Um, in late April, I will say for myself, I was on a podcast hosted by Bill Kirst, who is a leader in organizational change. And we talked um, about folks feeling the effects of the quarantine. And, um, you know, it was 30 days in when I did this webinar. And Bill said, um, a year from now, will we be the same or will we be different? Will teaching and learning be what it was before COVID? or will teaching and learning in the fall and beyond be different? Um, as the 30 days of uh, quarantine turned into 45, then 60 uh, and more, and the school year concluded with kind of, you know, virtual and drive-through graduations, I wondered to myself, will teaching and learning ever be the same? You know, this thrust into distance learning, um, using technology and software and apps to a degree that they were not previously used 
has I think made a profound impact on our teachers. So whether that transition to distance virtual learning was fairly easy or extremely difficult, teachers persevered. Uh, and that's huge. Uh, even with obstacles and challenges, teachers planned and delivered lessons. They worked with small and whole groups of students. They accessed even more creativity. Uh, and many went above and beyond to connect with their students, both online and on front lawns of student homes. So over time, I learned of the tech anxiety decreasing and the tech comfortability increasing, which leads me to believe that we might be ripe to embrace virtual coaching. But there are some challenges to this. Um, whether it's in-person or virtual, the, the researchers do share two key challenges to coaching. Um, the first is teacher buy-in. Uh, and the second is finding quality coaches. So notwithstanding a coach's expertise or enthusiasm, you can get those coaches who are just super excited to coach, um, it's unlikely to have an impact on teacher and teacher, uh, sorry, teaching and learning if the teachers themselves really aren't invested. Um, so I wanted to share this uh, story. Um, they share this example in their analysis. Um, it was a study that was done in 2010, and it was an evaluation of a statewide program in Florida uh, where 2,300 uh, coaches worked with teachers across content areas to increase literacy instruction. Um, and across the four years that they studied, the effect on reading achievement was significant in only two of the four years, um, and the average effect was extremely small. Um, the researchers share that the lack of impact could be due to any number of factors, including the mandatory nature of the program. So teachers were required to participate. Um, so two solutions to that. One, and this is in the research, start with the willing, you know, start with those teachers who really, um, like Dr. Gwande, buy into this idea of coaching is going to make us better and I want it. So start with the willing. Um, stay small, you know, um, in terms of um, schools and dioceses, you know, just make sure that whatever coaching program you are involved in, um, that there's oversight and that, that um, that it stays small because we can see in this example from Florida that um, 2,300 coaches um, working with um, teachers who are mandated to participate um, was not effective. Um, and then solution three uh, it really requires the leadership at the school level to develop that culture of continuous improvement and trust that um, teachers have to feel um, that they're honored, that um, that we have to move away from this idea that um, observation and feedback is about documenting shortcomings. Um, and rather, I think we need to see um, our teachers' strengths, um, create an environment where they can take risks and reflect and um, engage in ongoing uh, professional learning. So the second challenge um, that the authors, the researchers speak to, again, evident in the Florida Reading Program, is having access to high quality local coaches. So simply put, it's just really hard to find people with the diversity of expertise that um, is needed to support teachers with various needs. So utilizing um, administrators as coaches only adds to the full plate of responsibilities that principals already have. Um, and it's likely to blur the line between evaluation and professional learning. And then utilizing peers um, and pairing teachers is I think a very promising opportunity, um, but there would be concerns about confidentiality, trust, scheduling, um, the time commitment of our teachers, um, and if compensation uh, were part of that as well. So um, the other part of this that I think is important to share is that um, the hours of coaching, um, there's a lack of evidence to support, um, they call it dosage, you know, the amount of hours um, that a coach is involved with teachers. 
Um, so when you look at this um, specific quote, it says there's a lack of evidence supporting dosage, dosage effects um, suggests the quality and focus of coaching may be more important than the actual number of contact hours. So um, the quality over the quantity there. Um, just a couple of solutions here. Uh, utilize in-person coaches. And so you may be lucky enough to find someone locally um, who is a great coach, or you may have the funds to cover the travel costs um, of a coach. Um, that's great too. Um, the other solution, again, is to use virtual coaches. Uh, the pros of virtual coaches, there are many. Uh, the researchers speak to them in their report. Uh, they share that virtual coaches provide you access um, to high quality coaches um, and may increase the number of teachers that a coach uh, can work with. Um, it reduces the, the concerns that the teacher might have um, because the, the coach is not on campus. And so it will certainly feel less evaluative if the um, coach is not on campus. And then lastly, it just lowers the costs because um, travel is not, um, is not an issue. So two challenges, um, teacher buy-in and quality coaches. In terms of solutions, um, an additional part of that, that solution, I think, is using video. So whether it's in person or virtual, um, I think video is a very powerful tool that brings um, great value to coaching. Um, and why video? Um, because it helps us see exactly what teaching and learning looks like. So Jim Knight, um, he's a coaching guru. He's a professor, an author, a researcher uh, from the University of Kansas, and he shares that teachers have a lack of awareness um, of their teaching for three reasons. So I'm going to move through these. I'll put all three up on the screen. Um, but just think about this from your, for yourself and for your teachers. Um, you know, there's a busyness to teaching. There's a lot going on in the classroom from bell to bell. Um, and so, so do we have time to watch ourselves teaching um, when we're actually doing the teaching? So no, we don't. So we're really busy when we're teaching. Um, habituation, I think this is interesting that we kind of lose a sensitivity to something that we're exposed to on a regular basis. And I, I align this to this idea of like when I'm brushing my teeth, you know, do I remember that, oh yeah, you brushed your front teeth. Well, it's because you brush your teeth so often that you kind of forget what you're doing. Um, and the same is true, you know, um, in teaching, you know, we become desensitized uh, and we stop noticing um, things in the classroom. Um, and then the third thing is this notion of confirmation bias. I think this is really interesting. He talks about that, that we develop this quick belief about something and then we seek evidence to support it. So, um, so I think what's interesting about confirmation bias is that, you know, um, teachers may say, you know, centers just don't work. And then, then they might self-sabotage um, any efforts to make, to try to make um, centers work in their classrooms. Or you might have a teacher that, um, believes that their classroom is really engaging, you know, and that um, and they confirm that bias by saying, well, this, you know, these three and three to four kids are always raising their hand and they're always, um, you know, uh, engaging in, in class. Well, the class has 20 students, only three, three or four of them are speaking up. So video has the ability um, for us uh, as teachers and coaches to just kind of take a pause and look at really what's happening in the classroom. Um, and, and I love this quote um, from Chesterton. He says, you know, it isn't easy. It isn't that they can't see the solution. It's that they can't see the problem. And I think video can help teachers see. And once you're aware, you can't deny not only the areas for growth, um, but the innumerable strengths that our teachers possess. And with video, teachers can see the problem and work with the coach um, to find a solution. So what about um, other forms of training and workshops? So they did talk about this in their study. And then I wanted to share this other um, research from um, 1984 that's still true today. Um, and I'll say that just most of us rely on our title funds to cover the cost of after school tutoring, professional development, parent programs, lots of things. Um, some of us are able to um, 
build in additional funds into our annual school budget. Um, but kind of no matter where these funds come from, we're all called to be good stewards uh, of those funds and use them to improve teaching and learning and benefit the students and families that we serve. So a fundamental assumption um, is that helping teachers improve the quality of their instructional practice will lead to improvements in student, um, student achievement, right? That causal relationship between instructional practice and student achievement. And the researchers found supporting evidence for that link between instruction and achievement. Um, so any changes in student achievement appear to require um, improvements in teacher quality, right? So uh, we know that causal relationship. Um, what we can see from this um, graph um, are the findings from 1984, which are, I think, true to this day. And it's how I started off this, this webinar. Um, is that, you know, we go to trainings or workshops, um, but how much impact does that really have on teaching and learning? Um, from his research, from Bush's research in 1984, he writes, there's only modest changes in teachers' instruction, and that often doesn't lead to impacts on student achievement. Um, but what we're looking at is the relationship of um, coaching with training. Um, the researchers found with regard to student achievement, coaching was um, just as effective, um, um, that is comparable to other significant interventions. So again, when you're thinking about spending your PD dollars, um, what we do know is that coaching is just as effective as, as really significant interventions like comprehensive school-wide reform, um, high dosage tutoring, changes in curriculum. Um, so coaching can have a profound impact. Um, and in some cases, um, almost as much as any other kind of school-based interventions, um, like student incentives, pre-service training, um, generalized PD, et cetera. So again, um, Bush's research is confirmed by the meta-analysis of Kraft, Blazer, and Hogan. So what, if, what, what about combining um, training with coaching? So again, across these 60 studies, they noticed that um, 54 of the 60 combined coaching with other PD. And um, PD like group trainings, instructional content, and video libraries. And the findings suggest that teachers may benefit from building baseline skills, um, perhaps via a workshop or conference or webinar or a book study prior to engaging directly with a coach. Um, the findings also suggest pairing coaching with the rollout of new instructional resources and materials or onboarding of a new teacher with their curriculum resources. Um, so there is um, a positive impact of combining professional development with coaching. So to move on to this um, next slide, which is about um, determining your PD direction and thinking through, you know, where do you start? So I would say start with your vision for academic excellence. Um, what does or should excellence look like in your school or diocese? And I would say start with your accreditation documents. You know, what are your teachers' knowledge and skills with regard to classroom culture, lesson planning, lesson delivery, assessment and early childhood literacy, reading, math, content mastery across the curriculum? Um, how are your students performing on standardized tests? Are the parents, students, and teachers satisfied with school performance? Um, and then, you know, beyond accreditation documents, think about that graduate profile. You know, what are the knowledge, skills, and attributes that students should possess when they graduate from your school? Um, so after you've kind of thought through um, and really articulated, you know, sometimes as leaders, it's in our head, but we really need to be able to communicate it, is once you have a very clear vision, um, then it's thinking through, okay, how do I manifest this vision over the next three years? How do I work toward moving towards this vision uh, with my teachers um, and students? And then break that vision down and figure out what am I going to focus on this year? What's my first step towards manifesting that vision?
you'll recall again <laughs> the research that PD alone, um, that is trainings, workshops, etc., makes only modest changes in teachers' instruction and often does not lead it to impacts on student achievement. Um, so we know from the research that coaching does have positive effects on teaching and learning. We also know that coaching models differ in their characteristics, um, in-person, virtual, video, and other program features. So whether you decide to invest in your teachers through coaching alone, or coaching combined with other professional development, um, we need to think about what are those questions that we need to ask in order to make the best decisions for your school or diocese. So on this slide, you'll find some important questions for consideration um, for any administrator considering coaching by way of a third party provider. Um, so whether you're looking um, at facts or you're looking at any other company, I think these are the kinds of questions that I would ask as a, as a former principal and as a former assistant soup. Um, and I'm just gonna move through these. Um, you wanna ask about um, the program type, um, the coach um, it's and, and how you know what their background is and how how their coaches are trained um, you want to ask about program oversight um, coaching evaluations and program evaluations um, remember with program oversight in that florida example 2300 coaches working with teachers um, you know I would want to know what what company you know the companies are doing in terms of ensuring they stay small um, so that they don't lose oversight um, and then you want to look at alignment making sure that whatever the coaching program is is going to align with your um, with your uh, vision for professional development for your school um, and you also want to ensure that um, if you're going to bring in PD, how is that PD, that additive PD, going to complement your coaching? And then lastly, you know, you've got to consider the costs, of course. You know, um, and if, you, if you're using title funds um, to pay for it, um, then that's, that's a blessing. Um, and if you have other additional funds, that's, that's a blessing too. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't share with you uh, uh, our coaching program that I'm currently designing uh, for FACTS Education Solutions. Um, it is research-based and it does draw also upon best practices of prominent educators um, and leaders in the field of coaching. So folks like John Hattie, Doug Lamov, Sherry St. Clair, Charlotte Danielson, um, Robert Marzano, Jim Knight, Diane Sweeney, Elena Aguilar, and others. Um, and I'd say a key feature of our program model is that we are using video. Um, in the words of Jim Knight, video is a disruptive technology that will transform the way professional learning occurs in our schools. And again, given the last months of teaching and learning, uh, I think our teachers who buy into the value of coaching will embrace this feature of our model. Um, we use the Vosaic video platform, which was born out of sports coaching. Um, so when you think about coaches recording games, watching and breaking down that video with their players uh, to improve their knowledge and prepare for the next game. This same technology is being used in the classroom uh, with teachers recording themselves and partnering with a coach to watch, unpack the lesson and improve teaching and learning in a meaningful way. Um, our coaching can be virtual, it can be in person, and uh, we can also do a hybrid uh, model of those two. Uh, we work one-on-one -on -one with teachers and with teams, um, such as you know, departments, uh, grade level bands, uh, content area teams. Um, I also want to speak to um, the three types of coaching um, in our model, and that is that it's uh, relationship driven, teacher centered, and student centered. And again, you can imagine that to you earlier. Um, I work uh, with the administrator to determine the type of coaching um, that's best going to meet the needs of the school, um, recognizing that each type is effective. Um, each has varying positive effects on student learning at the center. Um, 
So we work with the school leaders uh, and their teachers to connect the dots between um, the coaching type and the student learning. So we work with you um, to determine um, regardless of coaching um, type that we're going to have an impact, a positive effect on both teaching and learning. Um, in terms of our training, we are building our own um, coaching core. Uh, they will earn preliminary certification after their initial intensive training um, that has several elements. Um, and then certification after successfully completing multiple coaching assignments. Um, coaches earn endorsements for specialized skill sets um, in their education and experience um, in, for example, inclusion or STEM or dual language immersion. Um, English language learners, uh, high poverty schools, and others. Um, in terms of program oversight, um, even as our coaches coaching services grow over time, we will, we are committed to keeping our program small uh, with supports for each cohort of assigned coaches. Um, and our coaches engage in um, weekly coaching debriefs and ongoing uh, video coaching reviews um, and coaching logs are reviewed during and at the conclusion of each coaching cycle. Um, and as well, our you know, overall program oversight occurs um, with regard to a pre-visit to begin the program, developing of the coaching plan, oversight of the coaching cycles, and a post-visit at the conclusion of the coaching program. So you can see that there. Um, in terms of evaluation, um, we see evaluation is multifaceted. Um, we're looking for multiple indicators in, in terms of evaluation. One is classroom impact, um, where we do pre and post evaluation of each coaching cycle. Um, we also evaluate by type. Um, so when you think of type, again, relationship driven, teacher centered and student centered, um, where we're looking for evidence um, of the impact on teaching and learning, instruction and improvement. Um, instruction and achievement, and in terms of relationships, right? That's um, a critical feature of, um, of our business is um, relationships. And so we wanna make sure that we evaluate those relationships and um, uh, both the teacher and coach relationship and myself with the site administrator um, and uh, ensuring that we have that high level of customer service to everyone that we're working with. Um, and then lastly, uh, last couple parts of this uh, model is the additive PD part. Um, we also ensure that we have alignment with your PD plan. This includes an initial meeting again between myself and the site administrator to ensure that there is alignment of the coaching program with your larger vision for academic excellence. Um, and this also includes a pre-visit between the teacher and the coach, um, uh, a live or video observation um, and a debrief followed by goal setting um, targeted to the specific desire for growth for the teacher um, to benefit his or her students, right? So that context-based goal setting. Um, this is followed by the ongoing coaching experiences um, of recording video, watching video, engaging in debriefing conversations, um, and partnering to utilize the resources to improve uh, teaching and learning. Um, in terms of additive PD, we do have a very talented um, PD team who can support your requests and further extend um, the impact of coaching. Um, as far as costs are concerned, uh, video-based coaching, whether it's delivered in person or virtually, um, does qualify for Title II funds. So I believe we have about 20 minutes for questions. So I just wanna say thank you um, and leave you with these three essential questions. Um, in terms of academic excellence, where is your school now and where do you want it to be? What's the right professional development to get you closer to manifesting that vision for academic excellence? And where does coaching fit into your PD plan? Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me via email or on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and again, I just want to say thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. So there's Jonathan. He's back up on the screen. And I see uh, one question popping up. Perfect. Um, so I'll answer this uh, right now. Um, so Sue asked, is there a list or a link to the coaching programs that were evaluated in the study? Um, yes. So um, if you... Um, 
go to the study, which is um, uh, at the bottom of several slides in here, um, you'll see the, uh, the list, um, I believe, that they provided um, in their study itself. I don't see any other questions coming up in the question box. I do see some chat. And I, but I don't think any of those chats are for me. So I will leave it to John. Any other closing questions that I can answer? Great, thank you so much, Dr. Abeline. You're I welcome. really appreciate having you on today. And uh, just a reminder, you. you'll receive a copy of the slide deck in our follow-up email, as well as a link to uh, the post-session evaluation. Uh, so we appreciate your feedback. And uh, if you complete that, we'll also be able to provide a certificate of attendance for the webinar. Um, and feel free if there's any other uh, questions or comments. Uh, you can throw those in the Q&A or the chat box. For convenience, I'll put a link to the survey, ev survey evaluation in the chat. I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment, uh, but you see uh, Dr. Abeline's contact info on the screen. So uh, thank you for providing that. And just once again, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we love having you today. I hope you enjoyed uh, this webinar and we also hope you enjoy um, our webinars in the future. You'll see a recording uh, link available and our follow-up. Um, so we encourage you to uh, take advantage of that and share the webinar with your friends and colleagues. So thanks so much, Dr. Aveline, for You're coming welcome. on today. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a blessed rest <laughs> of your day. Thanks. Bye.